I'll just, I'll just start it from here. Okay. So the question is, how many people do you need to have in a room before two people share a birthday? And you want to make sure the question is well formulated, so you want to exclude identical twins. You want to assume all birthdays are equally likely to make the analysis easier. You want to assume nobody's born on February 29th, just you know, making the calculations easy. And we can start going through and say, imagine we have n people. What's the probability that no two people of the n share a birthday? Well, the first person can have any birthday. The second person can only have 364 possibilities. All the way down to the nth can have 365 minus n minus 1 possibilities. And you know, this is a, written as a very compact way as a product. k goes from 0 to n minus 1. We have n people, but we start off with a 0. So it's, one, it's 365 minus k divided by 365. Well, 365 over 365 is 1. So this is really the same as this product. And we saw earlier that whenever we have products, we want to convert products to sums, so we take a logarithm, do the analysis, and then exponentiate at the end. So we want this to be the probability that no two people in n share a birthday. If we want this to be 50%, we want to figure out what is the value of n so that this equals 1 half. So the log of pn is the log of a half, is the log of the product. The log of the product is the sum of the logarithms. And now instead of writing 365, we're going to write d for d days in the year so that we can do this more generally. And the advantage of this is now if we go to Pluto, if d is around 90,000, we can easily substitute in. And we can also ask students, how do you think the answer changes with d? Clearly, we think it should grow with d. As d gets larger, it should take more people before we have a 50% chance. So just in a very rough sense, we expect something like that. But do we think the growth rate is linear in d? Do we think it grows like square root of d? Do we think it grows like logarithm of d? It's not immediately clear. One of the key ideas of calculus that's supposed to be you know, grilled and drilled into our students is that functions are damn hard to work with. Unless it's a straight line. We are really good at straight lines. So whenever we see a function that's not a straight line, we replace it with a straight line and do a linear approximation. So the log of 1 minus x is approximately negative x. This is doing the first order Taylor series. It's doing the tangent line. So again, if I give you a general function like this, I replace the function with the straight line you know, given by the tangent line at that point. And as long as I stay close to that point, this is a good approximation. Why is this pretty good for the log? Well, we expect k is going to be very small relative to d. So we expect this should be a pretty good approximation. Because this is going to be approximately the log of 1. The log of 1 is 0. So since k over d is small, the next term, the x squared term, is going to be much smaller. And this should give us a pretty good flavor of what's going on. OK, so this is you know, a nice application of calculus. You can do a little bit more work and make the analysis a little bit more rigorous. But if we want to you know, see what's going on, we get negative log of 2 is equal to now approximately negative the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of k over d. Well, the negative signs cancel. I can multiply through by d. And this is the sum we looked at last time, you know, the sum of the first so many integers. It's equal to the number of terms times the number of terms plus 1 over 2. So this is equal to n minus 1 times n over 2. This is then a quadratic formula for n to solve. I'm already doing so many approximations. What's one more among friends? Let's call it n plus 1 half squared over 2. You know, because n plus 1 half is halfway between n minus 1 and n. If you square this out, you get n squared, I'm sorry, uh, n minus 1 half. You get n squared minus n plus a quarter. So I'm really not differing by that much, but it makes it a little bit easier. And when we solve, we get uh, 2d log 2 plus a half. I'm sorry, we take the square root of this, and then we add a half. So n is approximately d to the 1 half times the square root of the log of 4. And this gives you a rough idea of how things go with d. So you know, in terms of the birthday problem, we have a really good prediction. And you can now take d equals 365, and you can try either of these two formulas and see how good of a job it does to getting the birthday problem. There's lots of other generalizations you can do with this. You can talk about having two pairs of people that share a birthday. You can talk about having three people that share a birthday. 
Uh, you can talk about what is the median number of people you need before you have that 50%. Isn't that ambiguous though? Because that, that's one piece of information when you think about the ABC for one. Oh, yes. Right, so in fact, one of the things I, this was the recap that was short. In the longer extended version, which has now been deleted, um, I talked about Mal yeah, yeah. I talked about Malcolm Gladwell's uh, book, Outliers, where he looked at the distribution of birthdays in the Canadian Junior Hockey League, and he replaced the names of the players with their birthdays. And you just saw this huge preponderance of names in the first three months, because you want to be the oldest kid to just miss the cutoff. Because odds are you'll be then one of the biggest kids in the league. If you're bigger, especially in sports, that has a huge competitive advantage. So parents plan that, or kids lie about their birthdays? Uh, yeah, both. <laughs> or those were the kids who ended up being good. Or those were the kids who ended up becoming good, and then they get more training, they get more specialized attention, and it becomes it becomes self fulfilling. Whereas in little league, because they do it by grade, it doesn't matter when you birthday. Yeah. But, but it matters, matters when you. But it matters. Because you're going to be played off. Oh, this. There's a couple of people who are so good that it's not going to matter an enormous amount. But you know, for a lot of people, that small little push one way or the other, and when you get that extra attention at a young age, it propagates. So in terms of you know, the birthday problem, there's a lot of great stuff here in terms of trying to get the answer. Talking about you know, having a well-phrased problem, talking about different complications, talking about what are the societal consequences. You know, there's a really nice part in, Gl in Gladwell's book where he talks about how we're ignoring all this hockey talent you know, because these people, you know, they were born too late. And so what we really want to do is we want to have like 16 different hockey leagues. No, that's not going to work. But again, it's another great way to illustrate your key ideas from calculus. The big idea in calculus is linearization. You take a complicated function and you replace it by something that's linear. OK. Um, since everybody's here, this will now be an official part of the class. And at least it does connect with other things. OK, so there was one more thing I wanted to say about the Fibonacci numbers. So we had talked about the Fibonacci quilt recently. We had shown uh, you know, the wonderful way to represent the spiral, lots of interesting properties. There's another way of defining the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers are the unique sequence of positive integers such that every number can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's. So has anyone seen this definition of the Fibonacci's? Yes. yes. So <laughs> Fibonacci's are the unique sequence of numbers such that all positive integers can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent uh, terms. We'll, call, we'll say positive numbers here. So here my sequence 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So now you can begin to see why I wanted to find my Fibonacci numbers this way. What would be the problem of having 0? Yeah, 0 and 1. We lose uniqueness if we have 0. We can just tack on a 0. What's the problem if I have two 1s? Again, we have uniqueness problems in that, well, which one do I use? And there will be some situations, you know, if I give you the number four, uh, 9, I could use 8 in this one or 8 in the one before. So if I want to have a unique decomposition, I've got to write it like this. So is anybody... Is the 2, excuse me, does the 2 still have to be 1 plus 0? Right, so I'm not really looking at what goes on before here, but you can view it as it's zero here, but I'm not going to allow myself to use it. And I will relate this to the English versus the metric system. Okay, so let's see why this, let's see at first that this works. So let's start off with, let's construct a sequence of numbers such that every number can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent terms. I start with one. Can I get the number two? I'm sorry? It has to be a sum? Yeah. Can it be a zero? I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, but one plus zero is not two. Can you use one plus one or are you allowing 
No, I'm saying I, I, I'm, I'm going to construct a sequence right now so that every number, every positive integer, can be written as a sum of non-adjacent terms. So you're allowed to so use one single number? I can, I can use each number once and only once. Okay. No, but I mean, can you just use the two? I can use the two. Okay. So and so, in fact, so I have to add two. Because you can't get to two without I can't get to two without adding it. Do I need to add three to my list? I need to add three, because if I want to get three, I can't do one plus two because they're adjacent. So I have to add three. What about four? Can I get four? Yes, three plus one. Can I get five? But they're adjacent. So I have to add five. Can I get six? Can I get seven? Can I get eight? I can get nine, 10, 11, 12, one, three, eight. Can I get 13? I'm sorry? Is it, is, it clear, is it clear now? It takes a while. Now, if I want to get 14, 14, 15, 16, now if I want to get 17, uh, 13 plus 3 plus 1 is 17, 18, 19, 13 plus 5 plus 1, 20, 13 plus 5 plus 2, 21, eight, 13 plus 8 is 21, but they're adjacent, so I can't get 21. 13 and 5 is 18, 19, 20. So I have to add 21. So I don't want to go too far off topic, but as a fun exercise, this is an equivalent definition of the Fibonacci numbers. They are the unique sequence such that every positive integer can be written as a sum of non-adjacent terms. So I can't use a term multiple times, and I can't use two terms that are next to each other. This is another way of decomposing numbers. Instead of doing things in base 2, base 10, base e, we're now doing things in terms of the Fibonacci numbers. Another thing is, rather than starting with this as the definition, we can say, let's look at the Fibonacci numbers, and let's show every number can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonaccis. So one possibility is we can take this as the definition of the Fibonaccis, or we can say, given the Fibonacci's, let's show the Fibonacci's have this property. So the proof um, is more important than the result. So the proof uses what's called the greedy algorithm. So what, what are we proving again? So we're proving that the Fibonacci numbers with the standard definition have this property. So, the, so theorem, standard definition of Fibonacci numbers implies above. And this is called the Zeckendorf decomposition. Not too hard to figure out who it's named after. Okay, So the Zeckendorf decomposition of a number is you can write any number as a sum of non-adjacent. The reason I like this is the proof, the standard proof is the greedy algorithm. If you've ever seen the old Wall Street movie, Greed is Good, right? this is a great algorithm. Basically, it says, do the best damn thing you can think of at each moment in life. Right? So somebody give me a number. Higher. 27. 27. So we start off with 27. And what we do is we write 27. We first throw away the largest Fibonacci number we can. What's the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 27? 21. And now we're left with 6. Now, what's the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 6? 5. And now we're left with 1. What's the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 1? 1. So this gives us a decomposition of our number as sums of Fibonacci's. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't prove uniqueness and it doesn't prove non-adjacency. Let's imagine when we were writing the decomposition, at some point we had fi plus fi minus 1 we had two adjacent Fibonacci numbers. If we had two adjacent Fibonacci numbers in the decomposition, well, by the Fibonacci relation, fi plus fi minus 1 is fi plus 1. And we wouldn't have thrown away fi. fi is not the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to our number. It's fi plus 1. That proves that this decomposition here is a sum of non-adjacent terms. It doesn't prove that it's unique. 
It's a little bit more work. Storm is coming. I'm not going to bother proving uniqueness. If you're interested, I will give you, you know, a little handout on how you prove uniqueness or that's a nice exercise. But this proves that decomposition exists and the decomposition has non-adjacent terms. So this greedy algorithm is always based on finding the closest to... Yes, the is at each stage, pull out the largest you can. Kind of building in a range of yes. And this is a huge idea in modern CS and a lot of mathematics, where at each stage when you're trying to decide what to do, greedy algorithm is one very good deterministic descriptive procedure. So not only do you get a decomposition, you have a way to find it. So that doesn't give you the only, depending upon the number, it doesn't give you the only sum. Well, it, turn, it, tur it, well it, tur it, tur it turns out that this is the only sum that works. That if you had two, it's unique. It's unique. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly show unique. But it also doesn't show you that, that you can't find it from the other. It's Fibonacci number by some sort, right? Well, if my number was Fibonacci, I would. So, th that's where you would need uniqueness. Right. right. You would need uniqueness there. Do people want to see uniqueness? Sure. All right. So imagine you had two different decompositions. So you have Fn sub 1 plus Fn sub 2 plus fn sub l, and you had fm1 plus fm2 plus fmk. So they may not have the same number of terms. But we know both of these sums are non-adjacent. If the two largest terms are the same, then we can remove them, and now we have a smaller number that's equal. So we can always do is we can say, let's assume x is the smallest number that has two different decompositions. And if these two numbers are the same, then when we remove them, we would get a number smaller than x that has two different decompositions. That's a contradiction. So we know these two numbers must be different. Not same. So that's the first step in the uniqueness. So if they were the same, we could remove them. And by induction, we would have a smaller number. We would have x minus fn1 equals x minus fn minus 1 has two different decompositions. That can't happen by induction. So we start off, you know, 1 has only one way, 2 only one way, 3 only one way. We can prove those first few cases by force, and then the rest follow by induction. So let's assume these two are not the same. That means this number is less than this. All we have to do is show that if we take all of this stuff here, it can't add up to more than this. And if you want, imagine you add 1. If I add one number to this, maybe this increases this by one unit. Well, if this increases by one unit, I don't have the next one, but I have the one after that, maybe. You know, the best possible case I could have is something like maybe F10 plus F8 plus F6 plus F4 plus F2 plus F0. If I add one now, F0 plus 1 is f1, f1 plus f2 is f3, f3 plus f4 is f5, f5 plus f6 is f7, f7 plus f8 is f9, f9 plus f10 is f11. So the best possibility is if there were no terms here, this was one index lower than this, and if I add 1, it bumps up to that. Well, that proves this is at least one unit larger. So it has to be unique. So not only does a decomposition exist, the decomposition is unique. There is one and only one way to write a number as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's. If people are interested, I have write-ups on the worst proof of this. So this, this is the standard proof. Um, I actually hold the record for the worst proof of this. Uh, I actually use the cookie problem from the first lecture. And what you can do is, this is actually viewing the problem the wrong way. If you want to prove a lot more, you can ask questions such as, OK, well, let's say I take a very large number. How many summons do I expect to have? You know, how many terms do I expect to have? If I look at a bunch of numbers that are approximately the same size, how does the number of summons vary? How long do I have to wait between summons? What's the longest gap between summons? All these questions can be answered, but not if you use this kind of method. If you use a more combinatorial approach and say, look, I have, let's say I'm writing everything up to Fn. So the possible summons are f1, f2, f3, f4, fn. I'm choosing some number of summons such that I never choose two things next to each other. This is very similar to the cookie problem where I'm dividing numbers you know, among people. The only difference now is I have to make sure I, if I have exactly k summons, I have like k or k minus 1 gaps. 
and all the gaps have to be at least two. Except for the first gap at the very beginning, which could be one, it's a technical annoyance. But you can do this in terms of the cookie problem. And you can get explicit formulas for how many numbers have exactly k summons where their largest summon is fm. It turns out it's a binomial coefficient. And you can make an enormous amount of stuff. You just need to know elementary binomial coefficients. So if anybody's interested, you know, email me. There's a lot of stuff you can do along those lines. It's another example of if you have multiple ways of looking at something, there's advantages to each. The greedy algorithm is a hugely popular algorithm in a lot of mathematics and computer science. It's a great thing to know. It's deterministic. At every moment in time, this is what to do. There's no thinking. It's like the quadratic formula. You know, there's no thinking anymore when you use the quadratic formula. How else can you factor if you don't know the quadratic formula? Sorry. Completing the square, but you know, let's say I give you, you know, x squared minus 5x plus 6. How do you factor this? Yeah. So it's, what is it? Yeah. So a lot of you got this faster than using the quadratic. You use the method of divine inspiration. In some sense, right? Figure it out. Figure it out. Just looked at it, wrote it down, see it works. And so for a lot of problems like this, you don't need to go through the whole rigmarole of the quadratic formula. You can just look and write down the answer. This is divine inspiration. It gets harder, but <laughs> for things like this, you know, especially cookbook problems we give our students, which have integer solutions, divine inspiration works very well. But if it doesn't work, we can always fall back on the quadratic formula. So in some sense, there's no excuse for getting a factorization wrong of a quadratic because you can always use the quadratic formula. In terms of how quickly you can do it, this is faster if you see it than using the quadratic formula. And you don't have to worry about some of the simplifications. That's a huge advantage of a method like this to the quadratic formula. But it's nice to know that we have in the bank the quadratic formula. We have a completely mechanical procedure. That's what the greedy algorithm is. It's a very mechanical procedure. There is no freedom at any step as to what to do. At each step, here's what I want you to do. Okay. And then, okay, and this is what you do here, and this is what you do here, and this is what you do. There's no freedom to choose. And then, it's comforting. You know, it's very easy to explain and just plug away. And it will often yield really good answers. And there are some times when it will not necessarily yield the optimal answer, but it might yield something very close to optimal with very little work. And there's, there's disadvantages because it has no freedom or flexibility. So you might want to supplement it somehow, but there's a lot of great stuff you can talk to students. So you know, with just the Fibonacci numbers, which is something hopefully your students have seen many times, here's a nice twist on it, which leads to computer science, which leads to dynamic algorithms, which leads to you know, freedom versus flexibility. Lots of great issues to talk about. And so it all comes down to you know, writing numbers as you know, sums of non-adjacent terms. So I promised to connect this to kilometers and miles. So I heard of this from Carl Pomerantz, but uh, I was talking with a couple of people recently, and they said uh, George Andrews had independently discovered this idea uh, maybe 10 or 15 years earlier. So the Fibonacci numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. So let's take 50. So let's write the decomposition of 50. What's the first thing? 34. And I have 16 left over, so now what? Plus 13. And now what's left over? OK. Approximately how many kilometers is 50 miles? No. Well, well, no, one mile is about 1.6 kilometers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? So it's like 30 to 40. So one mile. Yes, yeah, so, so, one, one, so one mile is approximately 1.60934. So 
So 50 miles is approximately 80.46. I never said you weren't. <laughs> OK. So here is one of the worst applications in the history of Fibonacci numbers. What's the Fibonacci number after 34? Right. The, the next largest. What's the Fibonacci number right after 13? What's the Fibonacci number after 3? If we add these, what do we get? No, well, I mean, give me a break, okay? <laughs> so it's damn close, okay? <laughs> it is closer to the right answer than my drawings of squares are to squares. <laughs> Why is this so close? I can't imagine they had that in mind. Yes, the golden mean uh, is approximately 1.6. I, lo and I loaded up uh, 1 8, which is approximately the conversion factor between miles and kilometers. Is there anything deep going on here? As a mathematician, I can't, that's above my pay grade. I don't think there's anything deep going on here. I cannot conclusively prove that the universe is not structured in such a way that humanity would choose to make the conversion between miles and kilometers so close to the golden mean. I can't prove that, but you know, if I had to come out one way or the other, I would say coincidence. It was a design push that made 2.54 centimeters. It could be, and then you know, and then everything else from all this. But I mean, didn't the French want to define like 10,000 meters going from like pole to pole or something like that? When they made the when they made the meter, I think they want like 10,000 as one of the measurements, or so maybe from Paris to something. And so what, why is this going on? Why is this connected to the golden mean? Well, the conversion numbers are very close to each other. Right, so let's try to label things. So this is F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6. That's a bad 5, so let's make it a better 5. F7, F8, F9. And what we're saying is 50 is... 34, which is F8 plus F6, uh, th and then 3 is F3. And then 81 is equal to F9 plus F7 plus F4. I've shifted all the indices by 1. And now we use the fact that Fn is approximately the golden mean 1 plus root 5 over 2 times Fn minus 1. That is the golden mean. That's the golden mean. And so F9 is approximately 1.618 times F8. F7 is approximately 1.618 times F6. Who figured this out? So I, I first heard of this from Carl Pomerantz. And then he, I was at a conference recently, and I was talking with him. And there were other people. And someone said George Andrews also had this idea as well. I'm currently working. Uh, or when I have free time, I will work on a really stupid math paper uh, with Carl because he's promised me that I can have my kids come on as co-authors. <laughs> and so I have an Erdős number of two. Carl has an Erdős number of one. If my kids come on with a paper with Carl, my kids get an Erdős number of two, which is not bad. Uh, if you don't know what an Erdős number is, it's like the Kevin Bacon number for mathematicians. Erdős had over 500 co-authors, wrote over 1,000 papers. And so how you measure the path, you know, I've written a paper with somebody who's written a paper with somebody who's written a paper with Paul Erdős. And so my Erdős number is two because at one point in my career I went up to somebody with an Erdős number of one and said, my Erdős number is three, this is embarrassing, I'm a number theorist, I need to lower it, will you work with me on a paper? <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I was upfront about it. Yeah. I said, sure. <laughs> you know, he was a friend of mine. And so I'm trying to get my kids an Erdős number of two. And so <laughs> when you look at this, the, the conversion is not so good with small numbers. You know, is 2 approximately 1.6 times 1? 
No. But the further down you get, the better the approximation. And so if you want, I'll tell you my trick for the paper. So rather than converting 50, I want to convert 5,000 and then divide by 100. And then just shift things down. Because by doing that, more of my mass, more of my numbers is going to be the higher numbers where the conversion factor is better. Now, of course, this is to avoid multiplying by 1.6. <laughs> so, you know, this is not really high-level, high-fluted mathematics. But it's a fun coincidence. Uh, it's a great game for teaching little kids, you know, converting from kilometers to miles and vice versa. You want to go from kilometers to miles, you just shift all the indices down. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's a... Yeah, but, you know, so anyways, I, I enjoy this application. Okay. Any other questions on Fibonacci? I'm trying to just find things that have lots of different uh, avenues depending on what the background of your students are. And you know, here, to me, you know, my favorite things about the Fibonacci, to just recap, is the efficiency. You know, we saw the Binet formula. We saw where you don't have to go through every single thing. You can jump. The idea to have a key formula like this. We saw that difference equations can model a whole variety of different phenomena from population growth with different segments of the population to you know, gambling problems. We saw some applications to dimensional analysis, you know, going back to how things fit together. And when you're looking at sums of squares, think areas. And think, well, if it's going to be an area, it makes sense to involve maybe the product of two Fibonacci numbers as the answer. Is there a way to generalize this and get sums of cubes of Fibonacci numbers? It's not going to fit together as nice geometrically now. But do you think this is a formula for summing cubes or fourth powers of Fibonacci's? If so, what do you think it might look like? Is there a way to try to guess a formula like this? And you, know, you can do some searching on the web to see whether or not these exist or don't exist, but these become great ways to get the students to be asking questions and having some control. We then ended with um, you know, Zeckendorf decompositions. You know, this is another approach rather than using you know, base 10, base 2, base 3. We're now in some sense doing base phi, you know, the golden base. And you know, what are the applications of something like this? I've done a lot of research with undergraduates and even some high school students on decompositions like this. What if you change the rules? And so the Fibonacci quilt that we talked about, uh, I'm actually working with some people on a decomposition scheme based on the Fibonacci quilt. And so the idea was the Fibonacci numbers was a one-dimensional system. The Fibonacci quilt gives me something that's two-dimensional. And so, you know, again, we're not going to say anything about my drawing or artistic skills. Um, it's actually easier to draw it um, as the log cabin and not even try. And the idea is I want to decompose numbers in terms of my sequence such that I am not allowed to use two numbers that share a wall. So this has to be a 1, this has to be, this has to be, this has to be. Four. Next one. So, nope. I want to I want to spiral out and put in the terms of my sequence such that I want to decompose every number you, you know, as a sum of numbers where I never use two numbers that share a wall. So, for instance, I can't do one plus two is three because one and two share a wall. I can't do three plus one is four because three and one share a wall. Right. So I could get 6. Can I get 5? No. no, so I have to put in 5. Can I get 6? What do you mean? Yes. You have to put yes. I, I'm constructing my sequence just like I constructed the Fibonacci's as the unique sequence. If you can't get it, you have to put it in as your next number. I can get 6, 4, and 2. Can I get 7? So I, for 7, I can't do 5 and 2. I can't do 4 and 3, so I have to put in 7. Can I get 8? 5 and 3 is 8. 7 and 1 is 8. So what we now see is, that, damn it, we lose uniqueness. So uniqueness is gone. Can I get 9? No, I have to put in 9. And then you can see how the sequence spirals out. And so it turns out you can prove that there is a way to fill in the numbers so that every number has a decomposition. But the decompositions are not going to be unique. 
there'll be some numbers that have multiple decompositions. You can actually prove the number of decompositions is exponentially growing. You can ask, well, what if I use the greedy algorithm? Will the greedy algorithm work and give me a decomposition? Does every number at least have a greedy decomposition? And the answer, surprisingly, is no. It's you know, somewhere in the high 90s, but you know, not 100% of numbers have the greedy algorithm terminating. And so what I love about problems like this is there's a lot of stuff that's very accessible that are new questions that you can ask at a you know, very early stage. This is just putting numbers in a pattern. And you know, what can you say as you vary your rules of what's a legal decomposition? And so the notion of a legal decomposition leads to different difference equations. And it turns out that the difference equation associated to this one is a much harder difference equation to look at than the one with the Fibonacci's. And that causes some interesting features to emerge. Oh. Mm -hmm. So all the boxes of the one. Right. One Correct. So for instance, I can, I, I, can, I can connect the 1 to the 7 or the 1 to the 9, mm -hmm. but I can't connect the 1 to the 5, 2, 3, or 4. And this is the log quilt you have right here? This is the log quilt. Okay. And so now if I were to do the next one and come up here, what would I have? Is it all centered around 2 or is it...? Does it I mean, it doesn't really matter because it's going to spiral out. Can I get 10? Okay. 9 and 1. Can I get 11? Yes. Can I get 12? So touching, so I can't get 12. So I'd have to put 12 up here. All right, now you know, I, I come down and do the next one. Can I get 13? 13, 14, 15. Can I get 16? So if I use 12 and 4, nope. So I can't use the 12. If I use the 9, 9 and 5 is 14. I can't use the 2 then, so I can't use the 9 and I'm stuck. So we see I can't get 16. I have to put 16 in here. And you can keep going like this and see what would be next. You know, I can now do 17, 18, 19, 20. I can't do 21 like this. Or 12 and 9. 12 and 9 I can't do. But 12, let's see. So what, what number are we trying to do right now? <laughs> we, can, we, can do, we can do 20. So is 21 the number we're trying to do? All right, so if I use the 16, I've got to get 5. I can't use this 5. I can't, so I can't use the 16. If I use the 12, 12 and 9, so I can't use the 12 and the 9. 12 and the 7 would be 19. I'm stuck. I can't use the 12. If I use the 9, I can't use it. And you see after a while that you have to add 21. And so it becomes interesting to see what is the sequence of numbers here, what properties do they have. And it turns out there's an explicit formula you can write down for stuff like this. You can analyze the greedy algorithm. The greedy algorithm will not always work. So in the Fibonacci case, you want to find the decomposition, use the greedy algorithm. Unfortunately, there are situations where the greedy algorithm will not terminate and give you your decomposition. So you know, to, to me, you know, as a mathematician, there's lots of you know, exciting stuff with problems like this. You know, it's starting with something you've hopefully seen before, the Fibonacci's, and seeing that there's an equivalent definition of the Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers can be de defined in terms of legal decompositions. Well, once you have a legal decomposition, you can say, what if I change my definition of what legal is? There's a hypothetical situation. Um, let's take a football. And so in an NFL football game, the football is supposed to be between 12.5 and 13.5 PSI. What do the rules actually say about inflation? Does it say that when you give the football to the refs, it must be in that range? Or you give the football to the refs, and then the refs are responsible for checking and making sure it's in that range? If you put a football in at the exact low end, and then just see you know, what happens you know, as the pressure changes, is that legal? Are you allowed to, you know, pushing the notion of legality is not necessarily a good thing in that situation. But in this situation, it leads to some very interesting mathematics. And it's trying to take something you've seen and then generalize it. And say so the Fibonacci numbers were defined by this notion of legality. You have a decomposition and you can't use adjacent. What if I said you can use, um, yeah, do, do people want to see one quick generalization? So we call this the Kentucky sequence. And we'll explain why it's called the Kentucky in a moment. I just want to make sure, is there anybody here from Kentucky? <laughs> Okay. What do you think of when you hear Kentucky? 
Kentucky Derby, anything else? <laughs> I'm sorry? Fried chicken, bourbon, <laughs> anything else? Or oh, people don't want to say it. <laughs> no. So here's the Fibonacci numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. You can write each number is in a box, and you can take only one number from the box. Well, there's only one number in the box, and you can't take neighbors. What if we now had boxes that had two numbers in it? And you can only take one number from each box, and you can't take numbers from adjacent boxes. So let's see what the sequence would look like. So I start off with a 1. What number do I have to add next? I need a 2. I can't take two numbers from adjacent boxes, so I can't use either of these numbers, so I have to add 3 and 4. Can I do 4 plus 1 to get 5? But they're adjacent boxes. Right? I can't take two things from adjacent boxes. I have to add 5. So now I've got 6. I've got 7. Can I get 8? No, so I have to add 8. Let's see what comes next. I can do 9. I can do 10. Can I do 11? OK, so I need 11. Now that I have 11, I can do 12, 13, 14, 15. Can I do 16? So you might notice some patterns here. Anybody notice any patterns? I love patterns, as you can probably tell. Well, the second number in this box is uh, power of 2. Yeah. The second number is always a power of 2. The next one is going to be 32. And so we can actually write down a formula for this. It turns out in this case, you always have a unique decomposition. And the reason we call it Kentucky is one of the people in my group when we were studying this basically phrased it as, so you can't marry your siblings or your first cousins, but second cousins are fair game. <laughs> and we thought that this was an interesting way to talk about it. We also have the Tennessee sequence, and we have all these other generalizations. Uh, I did buy uh, Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey, which I will be bringing to the next math conference where we present this. And I have promised my co-authors that if the paper is done, drinks are on me. <laughs> but you know, what I like about this is, you know, again, you start with something you've seen before. And you give people a chance to be creative. What would you do? How could you change the rules? How will the changing rules change the patterns? And you very quickly saw, hmm, looks like powers of two. These ones are a little bit harder to find. Okay, so what are you saying for five? The difference between 16 and okay, so next box, the next number would be 32. So, so six, 16 minus 5 is 11. Okay, so 8 one. minus 3 is 5. Yeah. That's the pattern. Okay. And so 32 would be 32 minus 11. That would right. Be the number and so what you're conjecturing already is you're conjecturing the next one's going to be 32. 32. And, and then 32 minus 11, no, minus 11, minus 11 21. is 21. So let's see, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I can't do that. I can't do two of them. It is 21. So you found the pattern. So this is what, the, what I, I love about this is the patterns are there to be found. And these do not require you know, five years of grad school. You know, they don't require a PhD in mathematics. They require a willingness to be playful with the math and to just explore and just see, well, if I change the rules a little bit, what kind of structure emerges? But you keep saying the pattern doesn't mean everything either, right? It's so I mean, to, to some extent, you know, as a mathematician, to me, it's, it's fun. And you know, it's, do you enjoy stuff like this? Now, in terms of, oh, right, right, this is not a proof. You would then have to make this rigorous. And you can make this rigorous and uh, prove it. But um, to me, that's not nearly as much fun. <laughs> and you're, you're dotting all the I's. It's, it's not as enjoyable as just seeing and sniffing out the pattern and just seeing that it's there. Now, the other thing is we've got to be a little bit careful because at this stage, um, when I'm using these numbers, I can't take anything from three boxes. So maybe I haven't gone far enough yet to really see what's going on. Because here, I can't do this, I, can't, I can do this, but only these two, or I can do this and this box. Maybe once I have three boxes in play for my summons to live in, maybe I'd see something different. So maybe your pattern does not persist beyond here, as you'd want to go a little bit further. This is very similar to the circle and slicing the circle, you know, one, two, four, seven. That maybe 
we've, we haven't gone far enough to see the true generic behavior. Okay. Any other you know, questions on the Fibonacci unit? Okay. So 